and I would like to even learn more. I'm going to say that I learned what I shared with you this morning. That was my view two years ago, and I've continued to learn more. And I'm going to add some other terminology to this. Okay. The context for this is there was this article that came out um, just a couple years back. Five things chemists and other science faculty should know about what's currently taking place in education research. And it pointed out that more and more attention now is being given to metacognition, student beliefs, attitudes. So it's not just the metacognition part. I was at a conference this summer, and uh, one of the most, I'd say the two most popular themes, tellingly, were flipped classrooms and metacognition. Hmm. So you've chosen wisely because this is current trends right here. Okay. Now, when I say there's more to it, I think this these are components of metacognitive knowledge. Okay. You are able to be aware of what concepts you know and which ones you don't know. You might have different now metacognitive strategies, like I talked about earlier. Those are then paired with aspects of motivation and behavior. Is it sufficient to say, I know this is a better strategy, but I don't use it? You know, what does it mean to pair this with aspects of what is leading to your motivation? Why are you taking this class? In terms of your behavior, what does this then mean in terms of your actual practice? All of these get bundled together in terms of something called self-regulated learning, or SRL. This little description, I think, is really telling. In response to met metacognitive awareness of a gap between performance and goal, and driven by self-efficacy and the will to improve, the learner implements intentional changes. Okay, what was my performance and goal? What did I hope to do? Pass the class, pass the test, get an A on it? Why is that? Is it because I want to do my best in chemistry, or are my parents telling me I need to do well in chemistry? Or do I have other <laughs> career goals involved? And what kind of changes now might I make? This loop to me is one where you're aware of different learning strategies, you put them into action, you get feedback. Perhaps it's on a test, perhaps it's on a quiz, perhaps it's a classroom discussion. That might make you change your strategies. This is the space that I think that we're exploring, okay? Now, in terms of metacognitive knowledge, there's different things that you can do. You could add aspects of metacognition <coughs> to your existing course, or you could add new elements or this idea of surveys. So as far as adding it to existing elements, there's more and more work being done. I mentioned just a little bit this morning about Okay, we're going to be providing practice tests. What does it mean to have the learner predict ahead of time? How do you think you'll do on this practice test? If that's a week before your actual test, get feedback on it. Be able to address weaknesses, and then uh, and then put those into practice. I don't know exactly what practice tests mean in in your space. Sandra McGuire discusses, and this was a surprise to me, that a lot of high school students. Once I asked this, I found it was true. They said, the practice test that I get is really the same as what I'm going to be asked to do on the real test. Eight students. I don't really begin studying until Thursday, and I get the practice test, and then I reproduce that on Friday because they've given me the exam. I'm like, what? And they're like, yes, many of my classes, that's what it means to do a review and get a practice test. The teacher tells me what is going to be on your test tomorrow. Make sure you can do this. That's not what my practice tests are within that. I think because, and for one reason, we're asking a greater transfer of the information. We've discussed it here. Now let's try it in a new setting. So this idea of having folks predict how they were going to do, have them get that feedback when they still have time to do something about it. Next. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The first time I got to see um, Sandra McGuire speak. Yeah. Lily Conference, highly recommend Lily Conference at Miami University in November. But um, she was kind of dispelling this PhD day mm -hmm. conversation she had, and she said most of the people in the audience that were actually professors right at the high school were only doing a class and doing four days yeah. of three exams. And she's like, I was mm -hmm. really done. You know, yeah. it's because you had PhD day and then you had exams, yeah. and that's all you did. One PhD day and exams, and then yes. your real part. 
way that I, I, I've started to put together sort of an ass assignment within that is to give a student, okay, here's 20 exam questions. I want you to sort these into the three topics that you find and to have them see, okay, in this topic, oh wait, there were five different ways this was asked. In this topic, there's these different ways. So instead of saying, hey, trust me, you're gonna add, be asked to do different things, mm -hmm. let them try to group it into the objectives and come to their own awareness on that. Okay. It's again, adding reinforced elements. <clears throat> there's a series of videos about how to get the most out of studying. It's from a uh, really cognitive psych person out of Samford University. Each of these are very short, six, seven minutes, outstanding video. You can just go to YouTube and look on how to get the most out of studying. These are gonna be ones that you are gonna find valuable and your students can find valuable too. Mm. So if you're not looking to do, hey, here's this whole pitch, <clears throat> these are outstanding. <coughs> They're used by some folks, Cardinals in biology, where <coughs> they make a supporting activity to it. Okay, watch this video. Okay, what do you think about this point? How do you connect this to what we're doing in class? So it's an interactive one to step the students through these particular videos. Really, really good video, okay? This idea of uh, using surveys. Here's one that was also out of biology. But what they do within this one is they ask students, okay, are you doing these particular actions? And they might involve these different metacognitive components. They're trying to sort of teach the students, oh, by the way, you could be doing this. You could be doing this. So they're almost trying to teach metacognition by asking about the metacognition. When they link that then back to, okay, <clears throat> what are the more successful students doing? What are the least sec successful students doing? They try to look within that and then also ask if the students grade increased or decreased, what kinds of actions were they doing? You find surveys like that in the mix. <clears throat> one of these that comes out of chemistry, Bunce was one, she had an interesting one. So she did a analysis of students, I believe it was at the Naval Academy. It was one of the military academies. And her study was, okay, if time is at a premium, what choices do you make when you're preparing for class? I started out at the Air Force Academy. I got a twin brother, he finished at West Point. I know what it means to say time is at a premium. You've got about 30 seconds in your day where you can actually, you know, unwind. So to say, what do you do when you are in a 24-7 high pressure environment? Unsurprisingly, they found different strategies with students that were successful or less successful, at least within that one. The more successful students were choosing strategies that were more independent, using practice tests to analyze what they knew and didn't know, and the less successful one were seeking personal help. I don't know, hey, let me just have a tutor help me, tell me the information I need. Okay? Now, this is a survey that Bunce <coughs> has within it, and it's a very short one, just a dozen questions, breaking in information as far as what might one do in a more deep or a superficial way. So first question, I want to throw it to you within some data analysis. If you were to compare A, B, C, and D, F students in terms of different statements, for agreeing, agreeing somewhat, the green versus the other part, do you find greater variation in terms of deep scale or surface scale? So is surface performance more reflected in deep scale or surface scale? Look within the data, see if you can read this. Okay? In a sense, is there greater variation on the left or the right? What do you think? Would you say if we're just looking at how much the dark green and green extend, it's more comparable on the deep scale than it is on the surface scale? That's surprising. Yeah. Seems like. Yeah. Now, yeah, if you look now at the surface scale, look at the specific statements. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do now is think back to a setting where the learning for you was very challenging. Maybe it's a, you were learning the oboe, Solid state physics, it's comparative lit in Southeast Asia. Anyone, think about yourself in that environment. Would these surface statements, what would you respond to? 
So read those particular ones and see what you think. I think about the times where it was very challenging for me to learn. Would I say I often have trouble making sense of the things I have to do as a kid? Absolutely. You know, within these surface ones, <coughs> sort of an interesting idea is once things become a certain level of difficulty, are we always surface? I might be. I mean, in an easy class or something I already know, I'm going to be checking the boxes for deeper. But if I am truly a novice in their learning, I'm probably a surface one. I don't know if we can simply say, I, an interesting one is do we always start out here and then do we shift? So I don't want to point the finger at someone and say, uh, you think that this is unrelated information? Don't you see that an ionic compound is also a strong electrolyte, which is also, you don't see that? Of course you don't see that, okay? <laughs> so that's something to keep in mind. Now, within McGuire's approach, I think that her pitch is doing both things of sharing metacognitive knowledge and also trying to have them adopt a growth mindset. She's getting at aspects of self-regulation, not just the metacognition. That's done, as we saw with an in-class presentation, this idea of students saying that they really struggle, what should they be doing, that really speaks within mind. This idea that they are being seen that they can become a better learner. It's not a fixed mindset. They can grow and de develop better strategies. Those strategies are essential because they're going to be asked to do different things than they have the skill set for already. And that the class can now support those. So what I want to talk about now is how am I making choices up here to support these best practices? And not just having them aware of these, how am I making choices that will make it inevitable that they will be learning chemistry. So first of all, after giving the pitch within this one, if I ask the students, okay, I think the information on strategies will help me learn, almost everyone agrees, yeah? Almost everyone agrees with the information. As this student says, this is the only one that encouraged me to strive to be the best I can. No other proper TA said I could, told me I could do well in their class. They gave me study tips. Wouldn't you say every instructor thinks they're sending this message? <laughs> you know? What does it mean to have a student say, this is the first time I've ever actually thought well, that was taking place? Everyone's got that horror story of the pilot that you look around the room and you think, you know, if right. you think one of you three is not going to make it out of this pilot. Yeah, I've definitely yeah. been with that though too, where people say they're just saying it as, well, you know, the bottom 20 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you say then if we said, all right, so that would be, let's say, one end of our outlier one. But I would say there's so many mainstream instructors that are not saying those words, and they're saying, look, I, I'm trying to sort, support my students. And the you're student not is saying, hey, I never yeah. perceived that you were trying right. to support me on that. You know? When I ask then, I, I mentioned that at the, um, I try to have them commit then to specific strategies. So this would be when I ask specifically, what are you doing or will you be doing this semester? After giving the pitch, I get buy-in to say that they're already doing things before class and in class, consistent with my pitch. This was like a week later. Or they will begin to adopt those. Very few of those say, nah, I don't think I'm that interested in what you told me. What's missing means they weren't at that particular session. Okay? The idea that McGuire's pitch creates a growth mindset and mindset, and the intention to use those, I think absolutely. Now, in this field, they find that almost everyone can express the intention to use something. <laughs> but what do they then do? Okay? So, one thing that I then explore, okay? So within this one, the blue are people that um, heard, in this case, the metacognitive pitch, the red were ones that did not. You notice there are still some blue ones that are quite down below. 
when I asked the students after the pitch, we saw that 99% were saying, hey, this is beneficial. This was another question. To succeed in this class, I need to study differently than I did in high school. Almost everyone agrees with that. If you do not agree with that, mm. you are doomed. Wow. I have just done my best to say these are the best strategies. Adopt these strategies. It's important. If you say, mm, no, you can almost head to the exits right now, okay? Why do you think someone would say, no, I think either they're saying, I'm already doing that, <coughs> or no, I don't buy that that's going to help. Either way, I think that you are in a bad space within the class, okay? So what I've done in different ways of looking, one thing that I've done is at the end of the semester, had a prompt. Because I recognize that you probably balance my class with other classes. You have figured out what is working for you, not. Tell me about in these different domains, what are you doing? Did you change your practices? And let me now connect that to whether you're being successful or not. I know what my, my, my message has been. Throughout the semester, I've been talking about these different features. So I'm interested, what do the students then say they're doing? And are more successful students doing different things than less successful? Okay. The way I look through it in different respects. These are the score distributions on my first exam, midterm one, two, three, and then we had a final. So these were the students scoring above 90 in the 80s and the 70s. So you can see sort of the, the different bins as far as where my exams fell. Okay. What's cool within this, this is called a ribbon plot. You can track through and say, okay, how many students that got 90 on the first got 90 on the second? How many people got 90 and then went into here? So it shows you sort of a longitudinal pathway, okay? And you can continue on and then see where do people with longitudinal group through. So this is called a, a ribbon plot. The reason I mentioned that is I saw these plots before. And, oh, I really want to make those. But I didn't know what they were called. So I was Googling everything that I thought might be there. Longitudinal plot, tracking plot. I didn't know it was called a ribbon plot. Once I learned it was called a ribbon plot, there's a spot out of UC Davis where you can make them for free. You just register. You can then like upload your file within that. And so these are cool for students' performance. I track how they might be answering on specific questions. It's really a cool way to show the different relationships you can also take these different bins and switch them around so it stays connected and stuff. Hmm. One more, if you scroll over the top, it will tell you how many, what percentage of the students were coming from this and from this. So I'm a big fan of ribbon plots. In this one, I'm interested in things like, what were the practices of students that were always successful, always struggling? What if they changed? What if they started out successful and they dipped down, or unsuccessful and they came up? If I look at that, what I did was my end of chapter, the, my end of semester evaluations, I looked at the different midterms, I grouped these responses into different piles. Each of my piles have about 20 participants in it. And I had one pile where the students were always strong, another where they were always weak, one where there was a decline, and one where the students bounced back. These would be their averages in my different piles. And I wanted to look at that then in terms of what were they doing, and what caused them perhaps to change. So I'm going to step through then my different features here. Before class learning, these are color coded the same as this. Okay? <laughs> so the blue, these are the strong students that reported, what are you doing before class? They were actively reading the textbook. Actively reading, actively reading the textbook. Okay? just skimming it or using the pre-class homework that I provided as sort of a, a self-test before. I also asked, did you change your practices? So the way you read this one, strong students as the semester went on changed their practices in terms of both active reading and homework in a positive way more than moving away from Strong students were improving the, the, their practices when it came to pre-class. Bounce back one, wow, this is one of my biggest changes. 
the bounce back one, so many of the students were ordered to bounce back within here, they began using the textbook differently. Now, I'd given the pitch early on before their first test. They had to see their performance on the first test, perhaps, and then begin to change their pr practices, or maybe their performance on their second test. If you look at the bottom end, no one was really moving to the better. Yeah? I want you to read this next quote. Put them in a category. Are they always strong, always weak, declining, or bouncing back? And it's too much of me talking, so after you put them in a category, check with the person next to you. Okay? <coughs> This is one person. Okay. One person. Oh. In description. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, the quotation marks finally took me. Yeah. <laughs> one person. That punctuation is there for you. Yeah. I think once that part becomes clear, yeah, yeah. in my editing, this is a bounce back student. Okay? This is a bounce back student, and it's interesting what's prompting their change in strategy. Okay? I found that when it came to pre class learning, Deeper learning strategies were employed by the more successful students. And if I contrasted this bounce back with the strong performers, the bounce back students initially had poor metacognition. It was reinforced by their early success in the class. That was that student that we just had. Mm -hmm. the, the stronger ones, the stronger ones within here seem to have different things that were providing them feedback. They would say, I noticed in chapter four that the information became more difficult, so then I began to do different things. Wow, they are really attending to feedback, not waiting for the test. They are looking, they have better med metacognitive knowledge because of that, okay? So, I'm curious, if after your first test, you've got students that are all, let's say, 80 to 95, with and they could have very different trajectories going forward. What would you do to try to have people stay on the top and not be on one of these other pathways? I'm open to suggestions. What would you try to do to make it so a student never even has to bounce back because they stayed strong? Any you ideas? Could, you could give a workshop to a bunch of high school kids. Yeah. And then, yes. and then maybe your students would start out. Maybe. That's going to be, uh, I'm definitely going to have to work to get around the state then. <laughs> it's tough. I think it's really tough because if you look at that, people who are staying up top yeah. are obviously adapting as they go. Yeah. It is remarkably hard to convince someone who has had some success yeah, yeah. and they think they're pretty damn good at something yeah, yeah. to change. I mean, I don't know how you do that. My question is, is with those bounce back students, mm -hmm. how do you, after M2, MT2 there. Yeah. Get them to bounce back. Well, yeah, how do you get them to not be on that green line? I know. Is there a way to say, you know, exactly. to, to kick it in? Because if and that a you crappy grade, back. yeah. Yeah. What were you thinking? How could you do like an artificial forced feedback, right? So you give them some sort of a quiz or something that's not graded, but mm -hmm. just to say, okay, it, it's, it's a forced bounce back yes. in between these. We've Sort of related to that, if I'm saying that it's beneficial to have you have a, a preview of what's coming and ask, do you know how to do this? Okay, after your first test, it might be more valuable, I'm just going to say, let's review that to say, okay, here's what your second test might look like. Do you know how to do this? You know, to have that awareness. <clears throat> what I tried this semester, uh, I showed them the same quote. I showed them the same quote and say, you know, I've, I've explored it. In the last year, this is what happened to some of the students. I give them the quote right here, and I say, this first student right here had a first exam score of about 95. And their second exam score was about 60. As soon as I say that, everyone's like, what? You can get 90 and then go down to 60? So it's 
why do you, you know, ask yourself right now, did you do well on this because you were learning or because you had a head start on the material? That was sort of my, if I have the data, let me try to see if that helps. So I'm wondering, I don't have all this figured out yet, yeah. but I'm wondering, so when we think about, right, like the change literature, I'm thinking about it in the context of consumer problem solvement, but any change literature, right, if what you're doing works, you're not going to change. Mm -hmm. And if somebody shows you a new way of doing something, but you don't have success with it, you don't change. Mm -hmm. So I'm almost wondering, like, could you manufacture something where in class you make them use one of these strategies and you set them up so well that almost everybody is going to be successful with that and yeah. then you get them? Yeah. You know, because I'm thinking about uh -huh. like so, some of the stuff that like Alan Van Heuvelen and Dave Maloney have done in physics, right? Is that they take like the 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 idea of solving a problem and they they change the context or they change the way that the problem is yeah. posed or they change the activity in such a way that people pretty much have to do what you want them to do and they have a good chance of being successful. Yeah. So it might not be solving the same problem, but they're trying something that we've been telling them yeah. and telling them and yeah. telling them that they should do, mm -hmm. and they actually get a chance to see that. It I think the, the whole regulation that's going, what does it mean to create lions? You know, know on that, it's about your actions with them. You know, like St. Lawrence, I was thinking about doing test one, test two, test three. If you get quizzes or something in between, yeah. there's exercises that you could get in and come along with that. Yeah. I think the, uh, it's sort of a pairing of well, how much of it is you need to have an awareness. You need data to drive that awareness. I know within my group there was a lot. Sharing this quote right here made them say, yeah, I had a head start on this. This is a pathway that I do not want to be on. Uh, but that's one we're exploring right now. Okay. Now, another thing within the, the early one besides, well, I guess related to this, what does it mean to read the chapter and use the book? These were quotes from people that were describing their free class. I felt overwhelmed when I read the textbook without an idea for our class. We can be less sure of what to, what to write down. There was no time. <coughs> if I could go back in time, I would do something different. Okay? I have almost no one that says, I don't know what I should be doing before class. They will say, understandably, sometimes life intervenes. If they have a job and they do not have time to do this. Or, I regret I probably should have made a different choice. I get that. This one of, I became less sure of what to write down. This was from a very successful student. I am an advocate, but I'm, I, Sandra McGuire would be one of the first to say, she's not a literacy expert. She discusses what does it mean to preview the material or do active reading of it. There are a lot of different ways that you can support the literacy practice. So I had high-end students that were doing an active reading within that, but they become less sure of what they should actually be reading within that. Does that look like maybe a, a deepening understanding that so when you're when you're a novice, you, mm -hmm. you go for those big high points and you think it's easily summarized. But as yeah. you as you know more and more, you realize it's all important and I can't. And our, and our material becomes a lot more complex after the first week's half. And so what I've learned is that. There are a lot of ways that you can support reading the textbook. If a student says, I became less sure of what to write down, experts know this. So how do you support reading the textbook? Turns out I am married to an expert that knows <laughs> this. Okay, she's in higher ed and she teaches about using textbooks or you, uh, in literacy, promoting literacy in high schools. And she works with training te uh, high school teachers to, be to become that reading across disciplines, all of this. So when I'm there bemoaning the fact that, hey, my students are struggling with this, uh, no joke, she then goes, she grabs this book off the shelf and throws it at me. She said, <laughs> you should have asked me 10 years ago. We know exactly how to support reading within this. Thankfully, it's a paperback. <laughs> so it's uh, subjects matter. This is written for all of us. It, focuses a great deal on high school teaching. It might be in STEM or in different disciplines. I say for all of this, all of us, because these are exactly my students too. They are not aware of how to use a textbook. They point out within this one that using a, I would say a math textbook and probably a physics textbook too, they term those as some of the most inconsiderate texts you can have. 
you're reading a math textbook. Here's a line, here's another line, this one goes on this, goes on this. You can't zone out. All of it is being important information consecutively given in the math. If you contrast that to reading The Great Gatsby, you can not pay attention for two pages and that green light is still symbolizing the same thing, okay? You are still in the moment. You don't have to be paying attention to all of the parts the same way you need to in a lot of STEM books, okay? Second is, well, what should the student be reading within this? Kathy's comment earlier is right on. What is the purpose for reading this? So one of the things that I've begun using this last year and a half, which I like a lot, are what are called um, reading guides. If you were able to take the chapter and say, I am over your shoulder as you're reading this. In the first section, what do I want you to be reading for? What do you, I want you to be doing? Let me tell you and direct you, maybe your first pass or later on, what do I want you to attend to? Once I started constructing these, it's like, I know my learning outcomes. Wow, even though I have a good book, I've just trimmed away one third of it. And there's other features that I've highlighted that I think is more important, that are more important. So each of these, I typically say, okay, start by looking at the learning outcomes, because that's what I'm going to be writing my test on. Those are listed. Do those make sense to you? As we start to do things, I am not, I am not dumbing down the material. I'm asking you many times, oh, well, keep this particular question in mind as you read the chapter. There's times where I say, okay, try to connect this with what we just saw back in chapter one. It doesn't mean that I'm lowering it. I'm trying to make it use the text as a resource. I find this, it, it would be helpful if you drew a picture of this. Make a sketch at this point. This is me over your shoulder. Sometimes I'm over your shoulder and say, this is a really cool idea. I'm excited about this part. That's what I would be telling the student within that. And what kind of then problems that I would be directing you to do. Notice that I'm also cluing them into, hey, look at these particular ones. Notice this is not a basic question like, who did the gold foil experiment? We are not going to ask that. I'm trying to have them look at ones to say, look, these questions are higher up on Bloom. Try to treat it that way, okay? Let me pause on this end. What are your thoughts on a reading guide like this? As far as you think, uh, what the resources your students might have, what you could provide. I, I don't do a video. I say, look, we're all looking at the same book here. Let me have us look at the same things that we value. What do you I, think? I like it for a couple of reasons. One, to your prior question, <clears throat> if you couple the fact that you've got superficial learning for a person who has a difficult time, this is providing them a path to do. You can't just say have people by mission. Yeah. You've got to provide them a path that's going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about this is like sort of just dumbing it down, prioritizing it. Mm -hmm. It's helping them decide what's important, which even yeah. your higher students were struggling with once they had, yeah. as you pointed out, a more comprehensive knowledge. And if we know what's important, and it's like, oh, well, they will identify that too. No. 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 And so I, so I like the idea, and I like the method. Um, question. Mm -hmm. Subject matter is providing that path from... Oh, subject matter then is going to give you about... Teacher? about 50 different strategies that to, will, do, to do support content learn content reading, <coughs> content area reading. A okay. lot of, another one, well, before I mention another one, <laughs> uh, other thoughts on like a reading guide. Yeah. How long does it take you to put it together? It, uh, well, I already know my textbook. Mm -hmm. And the, my main thought of when I looked through it was, wow, look how much I'm cutting away. And look what I'm cutting away that the student might have been prioritizing over other skills within that. So it was, um, I already knew what my outcomes were for this chapter. So when I went back to it, it, it's both quick and it focused me on my own objectives for, for my other features. So I, I teach the uh, astronomy and I have mm -hmm. a solar system and we were forced through a student cost to switch to the open stacks astronomy yeah. book it's 10,000 it's this yeah. big uh -huh. compared to my old one yeah and it's all fluff uh -huh. all uh -huh. the information is buried in fluff there's very few good images because it's designed to be read so everything is in text mm -hmm. and the students have no idea that's very it. inconsiderate yes it is, <laughs> it is I like that. To, I, when I'm lecturing uh, 
I have to put up the diagrams for my old text because mm -hmm. I have nothing to use. Um, part, part of the idea of then, when I mentioned before, driving them to the same text that we're looking at, I, I had very high achieving students. Well, how did you know that that's named that way? It's like, that's on the very first page of the chapter. They were looking and Googling it and going all over the place yes. and watching videos and stuff. And it's like, you never look back at the same resource. The answer is right there. Mm -hmm. I should just have that be the first bullet point. Make sure, you know, you live with them. And, and I would do things you know, in class, even with my old book, where I would say, OK, you know, what causes the phases of the moon? And of course, I always put the steering mm -hmm. shadow and all this stuff. And I hold up the book, and I point at the subject heading that says, phases yes, of the moon yeah, are caused yeah, by yeah. this heading. Well, they can clearly read that, but they are not realizing that that is something that would be a way to actually benefit. Yeah. And I, I've been putting together research uh -huh. for about three years, and yeah. at the end of the term, I always am asking, you know, what were the best things? Yeah. This is always like one of the mm -hmm. top two for everyone. Do you find Yours are better than mine. Because <laughs> actually in mine, you've got a bunch of questions in yours. Yeah. I have a bunch of statements in mine. Yeah, yeah. And the way I present it is, these are the things I want you to understand. Read this section until you understand yeah, yeah. this. The, the feedback I had on this one, I was, so my daughter goes to Cincinnati. And so I said, what do you think of this one? And she said, okay, make sure you make it like a checklist mm -hmm. because I will go through this. How about PDF versus document? She goes, make it a Word document because what I'm going to do is I am not going to space this out and I'm going to put my responses right in there. Now, when I was working with my summer students within these, my most struggling students, I said, how is this? What do you think? And they said, it's not sufficient. You are saying, do practice problem one point whatever. You can't just point that to me. I do not have, in a sense, I do not have the prior knowledge to answer this question. You are telling me the questions that I should do. That is not sufficient. So I've added, I've redone some other ones where I include more trying to support their prior knowledge. This, remember, this is how we count valence electrons. Now answer this. So I've added more that term. So my particular chapter reading guide, uh, I try to make it so it's about two pages. If I add that other information, now it's 10 pages. I'm making like my own book that you would sort of go through. I think my I almost need to stagger it. Say, okay, if the reading guide is not going deep enough, here's the supplemental reading guide. You know, within that, I don't know, but that's what they needed. They were not able to extract, they weren't at 80%. They weren't at 80% to be able to answer those questions. I needed to get them closer to it. So, when I have a lecture with you in high school, because I get a lot more in classroom, <coughs> I do a lot of those, not only the text example problems, but then the correlating ones from the body to body question. Mm -hmm. And since they have that in class, I mean, they work on them themselves, mm -hmm. but walk around and see, did they get there? Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, so we haven't been doing this, but we also do reading class now. We do these little quizzes, right? So they mm -hmm. do their pre-reading or they watch their pre-video, and then we have to do, usually we answer the basic level questions just to see, are you getting the mm -hmm. basics of it? And I'll be honest, we started it as, you know, the stick to make them do the pre-reading. But when we surveyed the students just the first year after we made the complete model, ones that and we listed all like the different characteristics and some weird things that we thought we were doing to them and asked them how useful were they, the quizzes were the most useful thing. They hated them. They didn't like having to do them, but they said they were the most useful thing. And you probe it, it was because it was helping them see what we thought was important. So I think it's, it's serving the same purpose, but what I'm struggling with now is how much more bang for my buck would I get yep. if I do that? Related to that, what I, so I will have, here is a free class online homework assignment. Here's four questions. And here's also this if you want to engage what the text is saying. So many of my students will say, okay, I'm going to try to answer those questions. If I can answer those questions, I therefore know this content and I'm good to go with it. I don't have to look back to see what was in the chapter because I know that information. I hear that. If the questions were all simple arithmetic, you would say, I know how to do simple arithmetic. I'm not going to look back and get additional information. But 
if I were to really say, do you know this content leading in, I would ask you 40 questions. I can't just ask three or four questions. So it's how do I have them both do a self-check on the question, but wow, this has the answer. It's not can you answer these three questions right here. So that's, I know human nature. If I can answer the question, I'm not going to get more information. What does it mean? Now, another one that I've had sort of, another thing, feature I took from this was if a reading strategy that you could do is, let's say you're reading, I don't know, Back to Gatsby or something, is, okay, your group is an expert on chapter one. You're an expert chapter two, chapter three, or in my case, an expert on sections 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. When we now have a discussion, the discussion will not be in the tone of, tell me about stoichiometry. It will be, discuss for me how stoichiometry is presented in our textbook. Because my students, with their prior knowledge, say, hey, I know how to do it because I did it in high school and I have this understanding. If there's all of this additional stuff, let's have this be the framework for our discussion. If there's these really good questions or prompts, let's now discuss this. And again, I come back to part of my motivation to drive, if you have a good resource within that, that can be worth discussing. Now, if you have this open stacks one and you don't want to discuss that, I think you're in a different, different space. But there's a lot of good tips, I would say, within this when you use the textbook. And part of me is also, I'll be honest, I am not going to make a supporting video for every topic in this class. I haven't made hardly a video. I feel like we already have this resource. Let's learn. You can read. Let's learn how to use the resource that we all have instead of me making a mistake. It's interesting because you know you said one of the slides earlier had, I think, strategies people who ended up being more successful yeah. use versus less successful, and one of the ones less successful was going for tutoring, like personal yeah. invention. And in a way, yeah. I'm seeing like if you need a 10-page version of this, that yeah. it's. The question is, is it because your background is so weak yeah. that you feel you need that and you, you don't know where to go? Yeah, or is it yeah. enabling someone to try to do your thinking for okay, you? Okay, so in terms of tutoring, this is all the same person, okay? Read this person, basically. Yeah. I said, this is the only student that voiced this particular perspective on the course. This is also a non-traditional student that was coming back that was in somewhat different space. How do you think this student did? Always strong, always weak, decline or bounce back? That's setting you up that you would say, this is a declining student. So they went from like 80%, 30%, 80%. Really? They were finding a pathway that ended up working for them. They ended up indeed changing. They were critical of how I was trying to set it up, but they found a pathway that worked for them. My takeaway personally is I do not want to make my pathway, hey, it's my way or the highway. I want to give some autonomy as far as how you're deciding it. So when I do like a pre-class homework assignment, I call it pre-class, but it's due at midnight. If you really want to come to class first, I don't think that's the best practice, but if you want to come to class first, see it, and then see it to apply it, if you've decided that that's actually working better for you, who am I to say it's not? There's going to be some people that that is a better strategy. So I don't make mine all one size fits all. I try to have some flexibility in there. That's my takeaway on it. Um, the, Do you have feedback on specific yeah, yeah, yeah. strategies? <coughs> Did, you, did they tell you what their strategy was that did work for them? They were, they were the, in that category of, I need to just go to a tutor. I need to be talking with them and working with them. I think for any of these, if you are learning new things, at least in my class, you've got to see it about three times. You've got to perhaps see it before class, see how we discuss it in class, return to it now in the book. That's another thing. If students 
it was really news to them that if they used this book before class, they could also use it after class. What? what do you mean I would go back to that? Did you understand it the first time? Hell no. How about in class? Oh, that helped. I bet if you go back now, it's going to make more sense to you. That was really, I don't understand that. Okay, that. Okay. So I think within these, my criticism, not so much criticism, comment on tutoring within those, I think you got to see it multiple times. When they come to my office hours and I say exactly the same thing that I've said before and they say, oh, now I get it, they were ready to get it. Okay. And there's a, I don't know how the tutoring works at the university when most of the students who we have in high school think of tutoring, they think of someone doing the talking for them as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, when yeah. they come into my room, it's a, all right, what have, what have you got? Where, yeah. It's me asking them 90% yes. of the questions. Yeah. And when the folks say, well, it depends on the quality of the tutor, absolutely. I honestly don't know what would be better than that student coming and now we sit down for a half an hour and talk about it. I think that, you know, you are an expert. If they came to you, would you rather say, well, I think it's in the book there, or read this, or paragraph, or no, let me ask you questions about it. Exactly. Let's do it. You're experts. That's going to be really strong. I would right? tell them I know the guy that writes these questions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a pretty good chance I'm going to slip and tell you something you really don't want to know. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. When, it, there yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to what they're doing, like in class and after class, I again broke it down and looked within the different ones. A couple comments within this one. Okay. Uh, that idea of how should you use your homework? Are you using it as a self-test? Now, all of these, I'm asking, what are you doing? The strong students tell me, I am using my homework in the way that you described it as a self-test. Very few of the weak students end up reporting that. Okay? Another thing to draw your attention to would be, uh, as far as in class. My class is punctuated with discussion begins and ends. Stronger students were more likely to say, in class, I'm seeking to participate in the discussion. I know the weaker students might be too, but they are not naming that as something that they feel is going on as much in class. Okay? In terms of this one, other folks would find weaker students are more likely to say, my, point, my purpose is to fill in class slides. I post my slides at the end of class. Okay? But they feel their purpose in class is to be recording that information. Okay? I mentioned earlier as far as what classes look like, there's this instrument where you can sort of break down what does your class look like, what's the instructor doing, what are the students doing. Uh, students are listening to my lecture about half of the time in this particular class. Group discussion, answering questions, posing questions, that's the other half. So if you're someone that says, my main thing is to listen to lecture and fill in slides, that's a pretty big feature of the class that you're missing. This was a class someone came and coded for me when I was discussing with quantum mechanics. There's a lot more lecturing than that than almost any of my other ones. Okay? Um, the, this was a big one too, as far as how do you prepare for the class. Okay? Let me give you three quotes. A declining student, a strong student, and another declining student. Any surprise that strong student was crushing the class. That is unbelievable exam prep as far as what they were up to. This is another one where these same features, I shared this with my students about a week before the test because exam prep is coming around. Look at all that, you know, what I now say, wow, maybe what's really going on here is concurrent self-explanation. You know, that's really what they were up to within that space, okay? As far as a couple features then, they are doing what are called transforming instructional materials. They are not passively saying, you gave me this. They are making, like I'm saying within the a three by five card, they are transforming that. They're identifying what's important and they're making sense of it. So one thing I'm considering is, well, do I need like a checklist for that? We're a week away from the exam. You could deal with this, this, this. I could even make it an assignment in class. 
Let's be generating now our summary sheets. One thing I just want to address, okay? Another one is this idea here. When it comes to using practice tests, the best way folks have found is treat them like an authentic test. It supports what are called retrieval practices. By recalling the information in some ways, you learn more than if you were studying it. If we know the best way for them to do that, I can make you do that. So we've started to put our practice test within our homework system. Make them time, give you one shot each question, and we find that if we do that, they score about the same as they would on the actual test. Let's do that a week in advance. One thing that's interesting with that, we included a choice of, I am unsure about this topic, I need to study more. But if you check that box, you're missing that question. You would check that box. You know, I mean, the, you, there's conceivably, I might get lucky within that if this is worth a fraction of a point. I better get the fraction of a point. A lot of students check that and they said, you need to retain that. I'm like, well, tell me why. They said, I only go back and look at the ones that I missed. If I happen to have guessed right, I do not treat that as missing it because I'll probably guess right again. So you need to make <laughs> sure that I'm telling myself I don't know how to do this. That's fantastic. Isn't that something? The, uh, Last, what are we close to finish line here? Okay, cool. The uh, last thought is, well, get close to last thought. Look at this one. <laughs> now, this one I think really speaks to these aspects of motivation and behavior. Okay? Um, we, I've got a partner, um, Dr. Shirley Yu, that does a lot on looking at students' motivation, behavior, sense of belonging in a class, connecting it to aspects like gender, that's her thing. So she said, well, could I do that with your class? Sure, you can do a survey in my class, okay? So she did a survey in my class, it was online. After the first exam, it turns out that these psych people, they have all kinds of different surveys. You wanna know about sense of belonging. You want to know about intimidation in a small group. You want to know about motivation. You want, so I said, sure, I'll do it. I did not realize the scale of what I was signing the students mm. up for. So all of these after the first exam, there are papers about what does it mean in terms of your mindset, your view of perfectionism, your sense of belonging in STEM, instructor support, et cetera. And these are how many questions were in each of those. Oh, my scales. goodness. <laughs> okay? And together within this, there's about 175 questions. Oh, no. <laughs> now, did the student get like two points for doing it? Yeah, so I got a response within this. So I had all of this data collected, and at the end of the semester, here's largely a different set, also that will get you to about 175 questions. Okay? Do I find any value in this? I'm still a little skeptical. Okay? I'm skeptical because almost everyone is correlated with achievement. Almost everyone, if you ask things in terms of comfort being oneself, I feel like it's okay to ask dumb questions. Students that did very well in the class were more saying, yep. Students that were weak were saying, no, I don't, I feel bad if I have to ask what the dumb question. If I can do almost all the work if I don't give up. A students say, yeah. Failing students say, no, that's not me. All of these, if you look at them, they are both related, and I do not know the causality. Are you, it goes back to that surface versus deep. If you are struggling within this one, it makes great sense for you to say, you know, I can't do almost all this work unless, you know, if I persist. So all of these scales almost are all bundled together. So I am not clear, is it the way that I am setting up the class or does success then drive these perceptions? But the only ones that I found were not correlated, and those were interesting to me, were these. Mindset was independent. I think that in this class, they end up, I know they end up with a growth mindset. It's up to my actions within this phase. Whether that means I can succeed or not, that's a different question, but I think that I have a growth mindset. These next couple right here were what were influencing you in the sense, mm. are you here as an undergraduate because you're, you're parents are driving you to have expectations of perfection in this class. That was a wash. Okay, that wasn't necessarily related to their success. And then finally aspects of what did it mean to have, try to support classmates. 
but I'm really back in terms of motivation. It's a big chicken and the egg thing. Are you successful because the classroom makes you feel like you belong in it? Or, look, you're doing great in here. Isn't that nice? The person next to you, you know, you also feel like you belong with them. I know that there are things like uh, gender stereotypes that exist. I know there's a lot of those, but I don't know what comes first. So I'm right now, I'm still in between uh, the two chickens. Yeah. That's my last thought. Yeah. Questions, comments, concerns that I grouped here? Yes. How much of your homework and quizzes and exams and things is uh, graded by you, and how much is it online and graded by your computer? All of our exams are uh, multiple choice standard. And uh, our computer ones, those are, our online homework is also through a computer system. Uh, just within scale, I mean, I've got 900 students in my next grade. So that's within our, our scale of it. Now, in terms of performance with Scantron ones, when I've taught classes, like last semester, last year I had one where I was the only one teaching this. I could decide, do I want to do Scantron, open response? I'm more convinced that if it's, if it's open response, I can turn that into whatever score I want. You read the first one, oh, that's only three out of 10. Three out of 10. Oh wait, those are the best ones I've ever seen. Yeah. All right, that's nine out of 10. That's nine out of 10. So I can turn it into any score that I want. And when I do that, then I've ended up weighting that differently. Question two is now different than question four, because in question four, I never made that change. And in question two, so it's, I ended up having those be combination and I was learning a lot more from my well-crafted Scantron, multiple choice, mm -hmm. than I was from open response because I can turn qualitative into any number of things. Just that. Interesting. I heard Cooper describe it as a possible partial self. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. My students say they would love to touch Scantron, but I'm sure they're not sure they want to. Right. I, mean, I know I, we all know yeah. exactly how they want to do it. Oh, don't you dare talk with the chemistry department about how 